Hello, everyone, and welcome back. In this lecture, we're going to introduce one of the most famous inequalities in all of mathematics, the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. Now, even if you don't know what the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality is, if you've been around mathematics, you probably heard that phrase, the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. And if you've taken a class on vector calculus, you've probably used it, even if you didn't call it the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. Now, the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality has applications in vector calculus, as I just mentioned, but it also comes up in probability theory and all throughout mathematics. And for our context here today, we're going to show how it applies to Riemann integrable functions. And in particular, it shows us that if you have two Riemann integrable functions, you can multiply them together and still get a Riemann integrable function. Again, this is probably something that you've already taken for granted, but based on what we've been doing in this class, we need to prove these things if we want to use them. And this is something that we've already shown for continuous functions. That is the product of continuous functions is again, a continuous function. Now, what I want to remind you of is that in the context of general vector spaces, which includes continuous function spaces and Riemann integrable function spaces, this property that you can multiply two of the vectors together and still get a vector in the space is not something that we always have. In particular, the concept of multiplying vectors is something that needs to be defined algebraically. So I want to just really emphasize how special this property is. And in particular, where we get it from, and it's from the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. Now, just a little bit of historical context, of course, the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality is named after two very famous mathematicians, French mathematician Cauchy, and I believe German mathematician Schwarz. And Cauchy actually proved the vector calculus version of this inequality, whereas Schwarz was the first to prove it in the context of uh, integrals and as we're going to focus today. So it bears both of their names because they proved it in different contexts. But as I'm going to show you, it's actually the same thing as long as you look at it through the right lens. Okay, let me start by reminding you what the Cauchy Schwartz inequality looks like in the two dimensional space of, uh, or the two dimensional Euclidean space. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to say, uh, let x be a two-dimensional vector in R2, and we'll call y also a two-dimensional vector in R2. Now, if you think all the way back to what I talked about in the space in the vector spaces video, I've already said that this Euclidean space is itself a vector space. Now, the other thing that you might remember from a calculus class is the dot product. Now, the dot product is it tells us a sort of algebraic way to sort of quote unquote multiply two vectors. And you might remember that the dot product is very, very closely related to projections of one vector onto another vector, right? So what you're doing is component wise multiplication, adding it back up and adding up those components. Now there's, a very, very famous equality that's primarily used for finding the angle between two vectors. And that is that the dot product of X and Y, this is equal to, now this is the Euclidean norm of the vectors X and Y times cosine of the angle between the two vectors. And let's just remind ourselves, what is the Euclidean norm? Well, this is the Pythagorean theorem. So it's asking us, what is the length of the hypotenuse generated by a triangle with side or length x1 and height x2? And what I would like to actually emphasize here is that this Euclidean norm, so this is a proper norm on our normed vector space, R2, this can actually be phrased in terms of the dot product. In fact, this is the square root of the dot of X with itself. Now, what we know is that since the absolute value of cos of theta is less than or equal to one, right? Cos is between minus one and one. 
This actually tells me that if I take the absolute value of x dotted with y, this is less than or equal to the norm of x and the norm of y. Now this right here is the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. So, uh, sorry, there's a CH first. My spelling of Schwartz isn't great. This is the version of the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality that was proven by Cauchy. So that's where we get the Cauchy part of the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. And remember, I said the dot product is very, very closely related to the projection. Essentially, what this is telling you is the projection of, say, x onto y is uh, no more than the length of x and the length of y. So what we would like to ask ourselves is, OK, we have a new version of a vector space. We have a space of Riemann integrable functions. We'd like to first ask ourselves, what is the dot product of two functions? And then we can ask ourselves, what would a Cauchy-Schwarz inequality look like between these functions? Because you can see that the dot product and the length of a vector is very intimately related in the context of real values or in the context of the Euclidean plane. Well, if we have two functions, so let's suppose that now we've got two functions that are Riemann integrable over the space or the interval a to b. Well, then we define what we call the scalar product, okay? Uh, Sorry, let's, the scalar product, so similar to dot product. It's called a scalar product because it is a sort of product in the sense of multiplication of two functions, but it's scalar because it returns just a single value, a scalar value, a real value. Of f and g is given by, okay, let me write this for you. This is going to be, we use these left and right angles here to denote what we're talking about. So the scalar product of F and G, this is defined to be the integral over the whole space of F of X and G of X multiplied together. Okay, so what does this have to do with the dot product? Well, if you break this down into Riemann sums, so let's say just approximately here for a second, this is i is equal to one to n of f of x i bar, g of x i bar, delta x i. Well, what you can see is this is very, very similar to a dot product, right? You're taking the elements of f evaluated at each of the evaluation points. So you get a whole new vector and you're multiplying it by the vector of elements of g evaluated at the, uh, evaluated at the evaluation points. The delta xi here is going to allow you to pass to the limit as um, the number of elements goes to infinity, as your partition's mesh goes to zero. And so this is not actually that abstract, right? This is, you should always think about an integral as a sum over the space. In this case, it's a sum over an uncountable number, uh, number of elements. That's all of the elements in AB. And so this is essentially just component-wise multiplication being summed up in the same way that our dot product right here is component-wise multiplication being summed up, okay? So now the first thing that we need to do is we need to ask ourselves, uh, does this even make sense, right? Can I actually just multiply two functions together and take an integral of them? So the first theorem we're going to present today is going to say, that if you have two Riemann integrable functions, then their product is Riemann integrable as well. So if f and g belong to the space of Riemann integrable functions from a to b, then f times g, their product is also Riemann integrable. And essentially what this tells us is that that scalar product that I have above actually makes sense. Of course, you know we have to ask ourselves, can we even take an integral? And that's what this theorem is going to tell us. It's going to say, yes, indeed, you can take an integral. Okay, so the proof is going to be broken down into two cases. Okay, so the first case, we're going to, so we begin uh, with 
the case f of x is greater than or equal to zero and g of x is greater than or equal to zero uh, for all x in a, b, okay? So I'm gonna start with the case where these things are both positive. And in this case, we know that the integral of the function f and the integral of the function g is really just the area underneath the curve bounded below by the x-axis. Now, I'm gonna show you how to prove this in this case, and then we're gonna see that this case actually just does most of the work for us for every other case. So let's start this out. Let's say let P equal to, you know, A is equal to X zero, X one. This is our partition, BA partition, sorry, of the space AB. Right, so we always need a partition. And let's let, so let's say let uh, M F of I, because this is going to be the max. So this is the soup of F. I'm just going to write it in words so that it, uh, it's a little easier on X I minus one to X I. So I have this, the maximal value, the supremum value of F on the subinterval. I'm gonna do the same thing for G. So sup G on this subinterval. And I'm going to also define this one, FG, as the sup of the product on this interval. Now, the first thing that you should take issue with here is, first of all, Jason, how is it that I know that the supremum of the product actually exists? Well, note that since F and G are positive, this is greater than or equal to zero because both of them are positive. This implies that F of X times G of X is less than or equal to mf of i times mg of i on each subinterval. And so this tells us that there's an upper bound and therefore the supremum exists. So this tells us that this mfg of i is bounded by mfi times mgi for each i. So for all i. Okay, so indeed, the product is actually bounded. So similarly define, I'm gonna write this in words again. Similarly define, I'm gonna use little m's for the infima, mfg of i, as the corresponding infima, okay? So I'm not, again, I'm not gonna write it all out just because it's a little easier just to uh, write this in words than it is to write it as math for now. Okay, so let's put this all together. Hence, if I take MFG of I and I look at the difference to between the max and min or the soup and the inf technically, well, I just proved that MF of I, sorry, that the maximum is bounded by the product of the maximums for each of the F and Gs. Similarly, I'll just put a note in the, in the margin here. We can also say that MFG, so the infimum is bounded below by M, the infimum of F and the infimum of G. So again, that just follows by the same thing that we did with the maxima. You can do the same thing with the infima. Again, this comes from the fact that both F and G are positive. So we sort of have this preservation of order. We don't have to mix up, you know, maxes and mins. So this just, uh, this assumption really is just an accounting type problem. It just sort of keeps all of the, the orders for us. Imps go with imps, max or soups go with soups. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to add and subtract uh, an imp of F and a soup of G, okay? So let me show you what happens here. I get MF of I minus little MF of I multiplied by the soup of G, 
And since I subtracted the inf of f and the sup of g, I know this is sort of hard to uh, say out loud. It's much easier to just read the page. Um, I need to add it in as well. And so I get this um, right here, which this, uh, well, maybe I'll underline it so everybody can see it. This thing is positive. And this thing is less than or equal to the norm or the soup of G over the entire interval. Similarly, this infimum is less than or equal to the soup of F over the entire interval. And so if I put this all together, this gives me MFI minus MFI times the soup of G plus MGI minus MGI times the soup of F. Now, what was the point of doing all this? Well, you can recognize that now I've got an, a soup minus an inf of just F and a soup minus an inf of just G. So that tells me that now this is the sort of upper and lower sums uh, being subtracted from each other, which means I'm getting very, very close to Darbo's integrability condition. So summing over all i equal to one to n. So over all of this, the sub intervals gives, well, the upper sum of f times g with respect to the partition minus the lower sum of f times g, sorry, with respect to the partition, which is the left piece here of, or the very first piece of my inequality, that's the soup minus the inf and then times delta x. Well, based on what I've just written above, you can say that this is actually less than or equal to the upper sum of f with respect to the partition minus the lower sum of f with respect to the partition, sorry, not g, and then multiplied by the soup of g, which is fixed, that's just a constant, plus the upper sum of G minus the lower sum of G multiplied by the soup of F, which again is just a constant. And so taking the limit, well, because F and G are Darbo integrable or they're Riemann integrable and they satisfy the Darbo condition, the first sum goes to zero because the soup of G is fixed. And the second sum goes to zero as the mesh goes to zero, which tells me that by this inequality here, I get the upper sum of F times G minus the lower sum of F times G goes to zero as well, which tells me that by Darbo's condition, uh, or criterion, F times G is also Riemann integrable. So that proves the case where F and G are both positive. And what I really want you to focus on here is how much mileage we're getting out of the Darbo condition, right? Or the criterion. It's much easier to work with than Riemann, the definition of Riemann integrability. We've gotten a lot of mileage out of this. We've got to prove a lot of results in a much simpler way than if we were just going to argue from the definition of Riemann integrability. Okay, let's look at the second case here now. Second case, uh, now suppose, so now suppose F and G are Riemann integrable and they don't have to be positive. So let's just suppose they're arbitrary. Well, we know that F and G are bounded. All right, so since F and G are bounded, remember that means a bounded above and below, we proved that any Riemann integrable function has to be bounded, then this implies that there exists some number in R such that if I add it to X, or sorry, to F, this thing is positive. And if I add that number to G, Similarly, this thing is positive. And this is for all X in AB, right? So the fact that you're bounded means you lie in some uh, sort of vertical or sorry, horizontal strip 
in the xy plane. And so if I just push that strip up enough, eventually I'm going to be in the positive half or the top half of the xy plane. That's all this is saying. But now what we know here is that if I start fresh on a new page, we already know that the space of Riemann integral functions is a vector space. which implies that f plus k and g plus k are also in this space, right? Because if I add two continue, or if I add two integrable functions together, then the, then the sum is also integrable. Well, k is just a constant function. You can always interpret it that way. And so this uh, sum, each of these sums is Riemann integrable. But then from case one, This implies, while well, both of these things are positive, it tells us that f plus k and g plus k is a Riemann integrable function on the space as well, because both of these things are positive. But if I open this up, if I unpack it a little bit, I get f times g plus k times f plus k times g plus k squared. And let's look at this whole thing, okay? So let's use green here. This is a Riemann integrable function because it's a constant multiple of a Riemann integrable function. K is a constant. This is a Riemann integrable function because again, it's a constant multiple of a Riemann integrable function. And finally, K squared is just a constant function. So it is also Riemann integrable, but then, that tells me that f times g is actually equal to, well, this original function. So f g plus k f plus k g plus k squared minus k times f minus k times g minus k squared. Now, why did I write it like that? Well, also, as I just showed above, this thing is Riemann integrable. And so what I can see here is that my original function f times g is a Riemann integrable function plus a Riemann integrable function. Now I'm using the, the this is actually minus, but I'm saying it's multiplied by negative k and plus another Riemann integrable function plus another Riemann integrable function. Well, since when we add Riemann integrable functions together, we get a Riemann integrable function, which tells us my product f times g is also Riemann integrable. So that shows us that if you take two Riemann integrable functions and you multiply them together, you get another Riemann integrable function. Okay, so that means if we go back to this, that our scalar product actually makes sense. Let me give you some definitions that are associated to this now then. So definition. So for all F and G in the space of Riemann integrable functions, we define, well, we've already seen this. We use these left and right uh, error or uh, angle brackets to define the scalar product of f of x times g of x dx. And we're also going to do define uh, what we call the L2 norm. So define also the now we have to, this is gonna come with a little bit of nuance here. Now in terms of norms of functions, the only one that we've seen so far is the supremum norm. So this is a, going to be a new version of a norm. And this is going to be defined. We use the subscript two here to denote the, the L2 norm. And this is going to be defined analogously to how the Euclidean norm was defined. Remember the Euclidean norm was the dot product under the square root. In this case, we have our version of the dot product for functions, the scalar product under the square root, which is equal to the square root of the integral of F multiplied by itself. And I'm putting the absolute value there just because this is a convention in mathematics. Typically, um, 
we allow for complex valued functions as you get more abstract. But uh, you know, this would suffice to just say f of x all squared as well. You can just put round brackets around there too. Okay. First thing I want to uh, point out is some properties of this thing. So let's start with a little remark. Well, first of all, one, note that f of g, or sorry, the scalar product of f and g is the same as the scalar product of g and f, right? So this thing has a symmetry property. It doesn't matter what the order you put the functions into this thing is, it gives you the same value out. Two, this thing is linear in f and g separately. So that is, uh, the scalar product, and this is going to be important for our next proof. So the scalar product is linear in F and G separately. So what this actually says is that if I take two functions, F1 plus a constant times F2, and I hold G fixed in this thing, this is the same as having F1 times or scalar product with G plus C times F2, the scalar product with G. And I can do the same thing with G, which tells me that I get F times G1 in the scalar product. So I keep saying times because I think of the scalar product as a version of multiplication. It's just a little more abstract. And in this case, I get F g2 All right so if you go back and check what it means to be linear it means that it this thing distributes over sums and i can take constants out of it now here's the big piece this is the the main nuance so if i put f and and itself into the scalar product this is clearly going to be greater than or equal to zero because you're essentially you're doing the integral of the square of the function f and this is just a property of uh, Riemann integration, right? This the sort of area under the curve is positive. So that means that the square root is, of course, well defined here. And this happens for all f in R of AB. Now, if you go back into your notes and you ask yourself, you know, I called this a norm. What were the properties of a norm? Well, it takes a lot of work, but you can show that this thing satisfies the triangle inequality. Um, you can show that it has this, this nice symmetry property. Uh, but the issue of this thing is that um, it doesn't necessarily uh, satisfy the fact that if you put, if you get zero out of this, uh, you have to have put in the zero function. So that was the positive definite property, the first property of being a norm. So it actually fails one of the properties of being a norm. So it is possible that f, the scalar product of f with itself is equal to zero without f of x equal to zero for all x and a, b. So technically, this is what's called a semi-norm. It's not a proper norm because it doesn't satisfy the positive definite property. This is what's called positive semi-definite. So we have to be careful, right? I call this the L2 norm, but it's actually not a proper norm on this space. So let me give you an example. Example, if f of x is equal to uh, zero for a less than or equal to x, which is less than b, and one, for x equal to b, then you can check that the scalar product of f with itself is equal to zero, but f is not just the zero vector, right? So that's what makes this thing not a proper norm. Now, as you go higher into more abstract mathematics, uh, you can find that there are ways of making this a proper norm using quotient spaces, but that's above and beyond the scope of this class. What I wanted to show you with this example is that you there are different norms on the space of uh, Riemann integral functions. We don't always have to use the soup norm. And in particular, you can endow norms, uh, or at least semi-norms in our case, from this scalar product. 
right? So this is a, a, a new way of talking about how big a function is, right? Remember the original soup norm asks us, what is the maximal deviation from the x-axis? Well, this is sort of summing up all of the deviations from the x-axis, right? So it's doing a little more because you're squaring the function, but that's how you should think about it. It says, what are all of the possible deviations of this function from the x-axis? Okay, so this leads us to the actual Cauchy-Schwartz inequality, right? So remember, I said that's what the actual point of this lecture is. Um, now we've got a version of the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality for functions. So suppose f and g are Riemann integrable functions, uh, then if I take the absolute value of their uh, scalar product, this is less than or equal to, well, the scalar product of F with itself. So I'm gonna put a square on this and then to the power of one half, that's the same as the square root. And then you do the same thing for G. And what this actually says, so this can be written using the notation that I just introduced above. So alternatively, we can just write. So I wanted to present it in the theorem as uh, like the, the full expansion of this. So you can see where the functions come in and what everything is being measured. But really, this is the absolute value of the scalar product with F similar to the absolute value of the dot product when we had Euclidean vectors, that's less than or equal to the L2 norm of F and the L2 norm of G. That's what that's telling you. And another thing that I want you to think about here is you're asking yourself, what is the value of the integral of the product of F and G? Remember, that's what the scalar product does. We know that it's a Riemann integrable function, what Cauchy-Schwartz's inequality is telling us is that the value of that integral, plus or minus, so that's where the absolute value comes from, is no more than the L2 norm of F and the L2 norm of G. That's what that's really telling you. Okay, so how do we prove this? Well, the nice thing here is the proof is really, really fun and easy, I think. So for all T and R, Let's define, so define the polynomial. So we're going to define a polynomial. I'm going to call it P for polynomial, P of T. And this is going to be the scalar product of TF plus G with itself, which just so we have the full notation here, just to remind you, this is TF of X plus G of X squared dx. Okay, so this is a polynomial. F and G are fixed functions. Uh, now I'm allowing myself to just ask how much of F I want to add into G, right? That's what T is really measuring. It could be 100, it could be negative 100, it could be zero, it doesn't matter. It's over all possible values. Because this is a vector space, TF plus G is always a Riemann integrable function. And so note, well, of course, P of T is greater than or equal to zero for all T and R, right? Because this is a scalar product of a function with itself. And by linearity of the scalar product, well, what we can do, we have, so I'm going to leave this for you to expand out and double check on your own, but this function P of T, this scalar product, can alternatively be written as the L2 norm of F squared times T squared, plus two times the scalar product of F and G times T, plus the scalar product of G squared, uh, or sorry, the, uh, the L2 norm of G squared, which I could actually just write as AT squared plus uh, BT 
plus C, which shows you that this is a quadratic polynomial. Now, you might have to remind yourself about some very, very basic properties of polynomials, but since P of T is greater than or equal to zero for all values of T and R, this tells you that its discriminant is negative. So this tells you, so remember from the quadratic formula, the discriminant is the piece that's underneath the square root. So this says B squared minus four AC is less than or equal to zero which tells me that B squared is less than or equal to four AC, which let's take a look at this. What is B squared? Well, this is four and then the, uh, let's put this as F G squared is less than or equal to four. And then A is the L2 norm of F squared and G is the L2 norm, or sorry, uh, uh, C is the L2 norm of G squared. Clearly, some fours are gonna knock off here. And if we take the square root on both sides, I'm just gonna squeeze this in in the, in the very bottom of the page here because this is the end of the proof. Take the square roots, this leaves you with the absolute value of the scalar product of F and G, right? We took the square root of a square, that leaves us with the absolute value. And that is less than or equal to the L2 norm of F multiplied by the L2 norm of G, which is exactly the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality. Okay, so that concludes the lecture. Uh, and what we got to see today is some very, very interesting properties of Riemann integrable functions, right? We saw that if we have two Riemann integrable functions, you can multiply them together and make a new Riemann integrable function. This was very, very important for us because it told us that our scalar product actually makes sense, right? And then through the scalar product, we were able to sort of move ourselves back further into the abstract of mathematics and use that scalar product to define what we called the L2 norm, which we put an asterisk beside because it's actually a semi-norm. And then we use that L2 semi-norm in order to define the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality. And what the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality tells you is that the uh, scalar product of two Riemann integrable functions in absolute value is no more, it's no bigger than the product of their L2 norms. So it gives us a bound on how big that scalar product can be in the same way that the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality for vectors gave us the bound on the, how big a dot product between two vectors can be.